Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. We can actually go home now. <laughs> Not because I just don't like to be up here, but just want to thank the worship team this morning. Um, yeah, that song, Take My Life and Let It Be. We get to sing some of these hymns and they just roll off our tongue because we know them. But when you get a little, a different tune put to those words, you have to focus on them. And that song is, is something really special. It's meant something special to me this morning. So thank you, Brenda. And I still don't like to be up here. Well, last year, some of you may be aware that um, the conference ran a program called Spirit Led 2010. It was held at Two Ridge. And Shelley and myself, we've been pretty busy and so we decided, well, we'll get away, but as, as long as not only just getting away, but we'll get away and we'll do something constructive. So we decided we'd attend Spirit Led. And I wasn't really that fussed about going, but we decided it would be a good thing to go and do. You know when you've been to something or a program or an event and at the time you come away thinking, wow, but about two months later it's just a memory. You might have one or two points, but it's just a memory. Spirit Led 2010 for me was wow. And as I was preparing for the sermon, once again, it's still wow. So this morning my message is actually for me, but I want to share it with you this morning. As one of the conditions Shelley said she'd go to Spirit Led, because I had some workshops I wanted to go to and she had some that sort of appealed to her, but she said, no, if we're going to do this and go down together, we at least have to do one workshop together. So we looked through all the different workshops and we were touring and throwing, well, yeah, I like that one, and she, oh, no, I don't like that, but oh, yeah, okay. So we finished up the side, we go to a workshop on discipleship. And the person who was hosting that was Brendan Pratt. Some of you might know him from, he used to be down at um, Papatoe. I was thinking of Papster. It's Papatoe. Papatoe Church. And um, he was the lead minister there. I know Brendan from when I grew up, we went to school for two years. We lived in Mildura and I was, I was in his class actually. And Brendan is a pretty intelligent sort of person. He's the only person that I know of with a Rubik's Cube, you know, the old traditional Rubik's Cube, you could mess it up as much as you want, and within eight seconds, without fail, he'd have that back, back to 100% again. Um, he was amazing, and I was talking to him about that when we were down there, and he said, I still play with my Rubik's Cube every night before I go to sleep. Because he said there's something like a thousand years of constantly playing with it, and you never come up with the same combination how to get it back. He said it's very stimulating for the mind. But that's Brendan. Anyway, part of the going to that was... I know what Brendan's like, and he, he speaks, I'm, I'm a very down-to-earth, very baseline person when it comes to, to understanding and to, and to grasping things, and I know Brendan speaks at sort of a different, different level a little bit at times. So I went with a little bit of apprehension, but it was amazing, and that's what I'm going to share this morning. So some of this material is his material, and I'll say it now because I'll forget at the end. At the end of it, I asked him, I said, would he be willing to come to Wangarei and to share, because the way he puts it, like I can't even do justice to it. Um, it's actually a five, five uh, night or five session program that he cut down to one day and then cut down to a two hour session for, the, for our workshop and I'm only gonna do this in half an hour. So I'm, it's just a very brief snapshot of what I'm giving. And he said I normally wouldn't, I've, he said I've turned down lots and lots of offers to go places because his job at the moment is working with churches in the Sydney area. Um, going through help, growing discipleship and growing healthy churches. And he said, if one place I was going to say yes to would be Wangarei, and he said, and if the church is interested, he would, look, he would be prepared to come here and run a, a five-day program for us, the full program. I was, if I don't say that now, I'll forget at the end. All right, we'll just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask that you'll come be with us now at this time. Lord, just empty me of self, Lord, and I just ask that the message you have for me, Lord, will be shared to the rest of these people in this congregation, Lord, our church family. And Lord, may we leave here with at least one thing we can use in our lives to reach our neighbours, our friends, and to better our relationship with you, Lord. I just thank you and praise you. Amen. Now, we're not going to have a children's story because I'm going to give you some of the older children later on. Is there any, younger, any young children here? Because my wife, there is. So my wife's going to come down now with some 
a bulletin. She's made up a special bulletin that goes along with her sermon, so it gives you something to do, because sometimes when big people talk, it gets a bit boring. I'm going to try and keep it simple and, and interesting, but you never know. So she'll, my wife will be coming around with that. Growing in discipleship. Discipleship. What was Jesus' command to us, his last command that he gave to his disciples as he was ascending? Therefore, go and make disciples of your neighbor? Of all nations, everybody. Okay. Was that just something he said on the side or was that a command? That was a command. Jesus commanded us. My question is, what is a disciple? And this is what Brendan, the first question Brendan threw at us. There was a group of about 15, I think. What is a disciple? Follower of God, that's what I said, someone who imitates Christ. We had a, a few different scenarios. He said, yep, that's all correct. What is the purpose of a disciple? To teach? Would it be to make more disciples? Okay, that's what came out at the end of the course. And what factors make up a disciple? Well, there's lots, but we'll go to Romans 12. And all of Romans 12 is actually the basis for where this all comes from, but we're just going to look at verse 1. And all these quotes, except for the ones I say, will be out of the NIV. Um, and as we go along, the slides in between will have the texts, a reference text, so the, the, all these will come back up, just the actual text, so if you want to take notes, they'll be there. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, as holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So what are we to offer ourselves as? Living sacrifice. So do you think that's just part of you or all of you? All. Okay, a living sacrifice is all. It's our total being. And as you go through the rest of Romans 12, it breaks down as to what that actually means. What a living sacrifice looks like. And that's your homework for this afternoon, you big people. In between. Between lunch and the prophecy seminar, that's your homework. Go through Romans 12. But I want to put it this way this morning. Now, you all, most of you have a filing cabinet, do you not? At work, at home, in the office. Okay, you can get all sorts. You can get out of the warehouse, you can get the one drawer, three drawer, or two drawer, and five drawer. This morning we're looking at a five drawer filing cabinet. Okay? So you've got five drawers. Now, I'm going to need some help. This is where I need five people, five of the young people. Jasmine, Georgia, Katie, Luther and Eddie. Okay, you guys just come up here. Why are you coming up? Okay, as a disciple or a living sacrifice, that is the whole filing cabinet. Are you with me? Now, you're not supposed to be watching these people. You're supposed to be up here. You guys come up to stand up on the front here. Okay, the whole filing cabinet, all right? Five, now, five drawers. As a disciple, we're the whole filing cabinet. But now, filing cabinet has drawers. So each of these drawers is a factor or is, a, is what makes up that whole filing cabinet. Are you with me? Okay. The first one. Sorry, this is a little quote from Eddie Tupai about worship, which we'll come back to. Okay. Connecting. And these are some texts. Ephesians 2.19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. And there's another reference there. Okay, so connecting is one drawer. Jasmine, you're connecting. Okay? So that's one drawer of the filing cabinet. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay, good. Not sleeping yet. Good. <laughs> Doing well. Okay. The next drawer, which will be Georgia. And you remember this because you'll be back up later. Okay, Growing. Spiritual growth and discipleship. In Ephesians 4.15, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Okay, so what was our first one? Connecting. Growing. Okay. So that's draw number two. Draw number three. Sharing. That's Katie. The sharing. Evangelism and outreach. There's a which was our main text for Matthew 18. Go ye therefore into all nations. It's the whole passage. Acts 20:24. 20, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. What is the task? 
testifying to the gospel of God's grace, making disciples. Okay, Luther, serving, and we're going to look this text up in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Serving is part of the body of Christ. You're serving. Okay, Luther? All right. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Serving. And our last one is worshipping, individually and corporately. Romans 12, once again, comes back to our where this whole, whole piece comes from. And Psalms 27, which I'm going to read to you from out of the message, because it, it just, it's, it's beautiful language it uses for this particular text. So Psalm 27... Twenty-seven verses four to six. I am asking God for one thing and one thing and only one thing: to live with Him in His house, my whole life long. I'll contemplate His beauty. I'll study at His feet. That's the only quiet, secure place in a noisy world, the perfect getaway, far from the buzz of traffic. God holds me head and shoulders above all who try to pull me down. I'm headed for His place to offer anthems. Already I'm singing God's songs. I'm making music to God. And the message from our president, the number one reason for our existence is to worship God. We were made, saved, and will be recreated to worship. It's a pretty powerful statement. So as we just go through this again, we have the draw one. Connecting, draw two, draw three, sharing, draw four, serving, and draw five, worshipping. Okay, you can just go sit down, but don't go too far away. You'll be back later in the sermon. Got to give them exercise. They want to, don't complain they do enough on Sabbath. Now, as we look through, there's our reference so to date. Now, as we look at these drawers... Have you ever had a filing cabinet? I have at home, and there was one particular drawer that has all our business stuff in it. And I used to just keep filing stuff into this thing, into this one drawer. You know how you have the little, I don't know what they're called, the dividers, and you put it all in and drop it in? Well, anyway, I filled up, filled up, filled up, and one day I was looking for something, so I pulled the drawer right out, and the rest of the filing cabinet had very little in it. What do you think happened? Just about nailed me on the floor, because it was a big steel filing cabinet. But it was still the weight of the drawer was too much, and it, it just about jammed my feet. So it's very important, as we look at these different factors, that we have balance. It's important because each one of us individually will be strong in one or two of those areas generally, sometimes three, but, and it's generally the one that we always run to. So our drawer in our filing cabinet fills up, but the rest can be empty. And you'll see later on why this is important. So we need to shape our lives around those five purposes. And you know, it's not something new because those five purposes are the same for our church. And I'm going to read from our fundamental belief number 12. Seventh-day Adventists believe, fundamental belief number 12. Now just listen for the key, those key words. The church is the community of believers who confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. In con continuity with the people of God in Old Testament times, we are called out from the world and we join together for worship, for fellowship, for instruction in the Word, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, for service to all mankind and for the worldwide proclamation of the Gospel. The Church derives its authority from Christ, who is the incarnate, incarnate word, and from the scriptures, which are the written word. The church is God's family, adopted by him as children. Its members live on the basis of the new covenant. The church is the body of Christ, a community of faith, 
of which Christ himself is the head. The church is the bride for whom Christ died, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. At his return in triumph, he will present her to himself a glorious church, the faithful of all the ages, the purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but holy and without blemish. Did you catch those key words in the first half of it? It's a, so it's not only just for us personally, but it's for our church. So we need to start to think of a way that think of how we can implement these factors. And I ask you this morning, whose disciple are you? You know, we're all designed to be a disciple. This week I was listening to the radio, and um, we change machines quite often at the job, and sometimes I'll jump in a machine to do a bit, and someone else has been in there or get into a, into one of the vehicles. And this particular time I jumped into, I think it was the grader. And the edge was playing. Now, I'm not into radio too much, so I don't generally listen to a lot, but occasionally, if the radio's on, I'll listen to it for a while, and I was busy working, and I couldn't believe it. These two announcers on there, and, and they come across as everything's funny, like they're laughing, but if you actually sit back and listen to what they're laughing about, it's actually they're just laughing to make it sound like it's funny, and, it's, and they're having a good time. And what they were talking about, which is pretty disgusting, that one of them had just decided to drink his own urine. It was pretty out there station, but anyway, so it was like, wow, that's pretty disgusting. But just going on the fact that we are designed to be a disciple, within five minutes, ten people rang up and said that they were experiencing the same thing, trying it. We are designed to be a disciple by nature. Whose disciple are we? You know, we need to change our view. Who wants to be happy here? Lots of nods, hands go up. Okay. If you want to be happy, how do you be happy as far as the world view is concerned? What do you need to be happy? You need stuff, things, holidays, whatever. How do you get that? Does it just fall out of the sky and hit you on the head? It would be nice if it did, but it doesn't do that in our world. It doesn't happen like that. You have to pay for it, okay? So you need money. Now, to get money, how do you get money? You have to work. So what does that require of you to work? And this is, a real, this is one of those ones that when he was going through this, it poked me in the eye big time, nearly both eyes. I nearly was blind. Because it's your time. Okay? You've, got to, you've got to put in your time to earn money, and then your money can buy things, and then you'll be happy. That's according to the world. Would you agree with that? That's the world's view? Well, there's a big study that was done, and I'll refer to it shortly and get into a bit more detail on it. 98% of church members have the same view worldwide. 98%, and I thought to myself, awesome, I must be one of the two. By the time you hit the age of seven, you already have this consumeristic mentality. And I see there's a couple of kids under seven here, so there's, I'm in the 98%. Because you ask a, a little kid what they want. What do they want? Where do they want to go? It's called the Golden Arches. And it isn't heaven with a rainbow. Ronald McDonald, he's a favourite with the chicken nuggets. You know, people with this world view don't have time, and this is for me, I'll put myself in there, I, when I have this world view, don't have time to connect, I don't have time to grow, I don't have time to share, I don't have time to serve, and I don't have time to worship. These purposes threaten my ability to generate happiness. You see, if you think about it, if we have the consumer mentality, consumerism is heading this way, where do you think community is going? Because we have no time. But if we switch that around and make time for our community, or should I say, if our consumerism mentality is not such important to us, our community becomes important, and it's on the increase. 
So how do we counteract our connection? Because that's what it comes down to, isn't it? Our connection with our God and our friend. Well, the common threads that they've found, the threats to connection with God, is consumerism slash materialism. It's all about me mentality. You know, it's how, how can I be, feel good? How can I do things for me, for myself? which is contrary to Romans 11 and 12. Glorifying God is what's important. Noise. This is particularly important to young people, but I I get the feeling it's actually important to across the generations now. How many of us have noise? How many of us have noise? And when we haven't got noise that we have to deal with, we have noise that we, we like to sit in front of and be entertained by. I believe it's the biggest, the biggest thing that's going to keep our young people in particular, but a lot of people sidetracked from a relationship with God is the noise and the input that they have. Hurry. How many of us are in a hurry? That's a silly question for me. Externalism, the things on the outside. And are we comfortable? These are things that are, that are threats to our connection. There's a lot more, but these are the, basically the, the categories that you can, you can put them into. You know, we need to mould our lives around practices and habits that will, will remind us of what matters and gives God space to work in us. We have to have intentional commitment. You know, I think sometimes, I know for me, I get into this pattern where I'm just drifting along. It's easy to drift. But we have to, instead of drifting, we have to decide. We need to focus on some heart-building habits. And if you've ever read Psalms 46, it's a busy psalm. Action's happening. And in the middle of it, God says, stop. Just be still. He doesn't say, know that I am God and be still. He says, be still and know that I am God. Spend some time in solitude. I have the, the fortunate, well, whichever way you want to look at it, but I think it's fortunate. Sometimes in the middle of the night when I'm out there working on machines and I have to hop off a machine and go to another one and I switch this one off and walk across and it's maybe 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning and I'm walking across and the stars are out and it, two weeks ago it was like that. I swear I could have just about reached the Milky Way. It was that close. Just the, my perception. And I stopped for a moment and thought, how awesome God do I have that he will put that in the sky for me? I don't care if no one else is awake, but I'm, I'm awake and I can appreciate it. He did that just for me. Solitude. And it's nice when the, everything's quiet. Just occasional cicada or something you can hear from the distance, but it's quiet. There's nothing like it. You know, spend time in worship. As a church, collectively, but also as individually. In prayer. Spend time in the scripture and as a doing some studies with my neighbour, with, with Adrian, where it's becoming evident. We, we go to do the study, but I sit there and don't say anything, and I'm getting just as much a blessing as my neighbour from what Adrian's saying, and it's becoming real evident of how important the scripture is. We take it for granted. We don't put enough emphasis on the, on the word, because this is the revelation of Christ. We take it a bit for granted. Fellowship. Church lunches is the best. And service to others. You know, heart-building habits in themselves will not earn God's favour. This is an important point. You already have his favour. Keep in mind that these heart-building habits do not save you. They are not a pursuit in themselves. They are able to help us grow towards the life God desires for us. And from steps to Christ, many have an idea that they must do some part of the work alone. They have trusted in Christ for the forgiveness of sin, but now they seek by their own efforts to live aright. But every such effort must fail. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness all depend upon our union with Christ.
So what we have become aware of this morning, how does that all fit together in our walk as individuals, as our walk as a church, and as in our walk to reach others and in their walk? So I'm going to ask my five volunteers, or delegated ones, back again, plus another four. So I usually thought you were missed out, Samuel, Matthew, Brianna, Jamie, four. And I'll bring Ashley up too. Okay. This is going to take a little bit of coordinating here. So do you still remember the, the five drawers in the cabinet? Okay. I'll just grab a mic. Okay, I want you five just to stay there. Now, you others, I want you to come across here. I want Ashley, you, no one will see you, Ashley. Come over here, Ashley, right over here. Okay, I want you to stand right at the end. And I'm not doing this to say where they're at or what they're doing, but this is just to illustrate. So when you look at a filing cabinet or you look at any of these kids, hopefully it will remind you. Okay, I want Jamie here, Samuel about there. Yep, yep. I want you, Matthew, right on the end. And I want you about here. Okay, yeah. Now, who are you? Connectivity. You're connecting? Okay, you're just about here. Stay where you are. What were you? Growing. Growing, yes, you're there. Sharing. Sharing, yep. Serving. Serving. Worshipping. Okay, worship, you just come with me. And you just stand at the back there. Okay, you just come over here, worship. Now, worship just floats around a bit. But it's all right, it's all good. Okay. If you guys in the front, just crouch down the ones that, you, that were up here before. No, you can stay, stay standing, you're right. You just float. Okay, over here we have a demonstration of a line. I like a timeline. In the centre here, right here, would be a knowledge of Christ. We'll call that line zero. This way is positive, heading to positive 10, if you like. This way is heading negative to negative 10, if you like. This is from zero, you have a knowledge of Christ, you start to move towards Christ. In this way, you start to move away from Christ. This is really important. In the 1960s and 70s, 60 and 70 percent of the general population were at this point. Just outside of Christ. They had I've only had friends or it was commonplace to talk about God. There were churches, people went to church. So it was just outside. In 2000, 70%, not even 60 to 70, 70% guaranteed now are way down between 7 and 10. Our approach to reach them has to be different. That's the common person out on the street who has no knowledge of God. To reach them, it's friendship. Now, you guys all stand up, stay and where you are, just stand up there. So we're still on our line. This is individual, and this is what really was the other poke in the eye when I was down at Spirit Led. Okay, we worship God. Once we have a knowledge of God, we start to worship God. Okay, would that be correct? We worship God with the knowledge we have. But for this instance, I'll just go and get you to stand right at the far end by Luther. Yep. Okay. So anywhere along this, worship come in, comes into it. Connecting. This is, I believe in God, but I'm not sure about Christ. My faith is not, is not a significant part of my life. So you're exploring, getting to know, connecting with the people around you in your church. That's our first stage. Okay. We come to the second stage, which is... Growing. Okay. I believe in Jesus, and I'm working on what it means to get to know him. So we're growing. So we've connected. Now we're growing. The next one is sharing. I feel really close to Christ and depend on him daily for guidance. That's sharing. What comes after sharing? Serving. God is all I need in my life. He is enough. Everything I do is a reflection of Christ. So you with me so far? Does that make sense? Where do you think 
as a church, and this is over, uh, in 2004 there was a, a, what they call the reveal study done, 280,000 church members in the States, 1,200 churches across denominations. So it's not denomination specific, it's all denominations and there were Adventist churches included in this survey. Where do you think the majority of our church members, because we should be on this side of the line, amen? Oh, should we be on this side? Are you asleep now? Come on. We're on this side. Of, oh, should we be on this side of the, of the line? Okay. Where do you think our church members, somewhere on here in these four, where do you think our church members are? Do you think that they're connecting, exploring, sharing, or serving? They get as far as the growing stage. And 80% of our church members are here in this growing stage, and they stall. And what was the poke in the eye was because I realized I was in this position. I was stalled. I had a good knowledge, and, and don't get me wrong, I st still do things in serving in, in different capacities, but it comes back to the fly filing cabinet with the draw other drawers were very empty. And there's a process. 80% of our church is here, and when they are here, they will not, or very, very seldom, will reach back over to here. Does that make sense? Spiritual growth is all about increasing relational closeness to Christ. So what's the key? Personal spiritual practices are the central building blocks for a Christ-centered life and a life of discipleship. Do you want to be here or do you want to be out here? Okay, you guys can all go and sit down. Many churches work from a model, the more a person is far from God, participates in church activities, the more likely it is that those activities will produce a person who loves God and loves others. Sorry, that G should be a capital. Many churches work from a model, and this is from the survey again, the more a person is far from God, so the further they are from God, and they participate in church activities, the more likely it is that those activities will produce a person who loves God and loves others. Church activity alone made no direct impact on the growing of the heart. You know, when you're in an aeroplane and they give you the briefing, safety briefing, in the event of cabin pressure drop, what will happen? The masks fall down. What's the instruction then? So you go around and make sure everyone else on the plane has got the oxygen mask on, then you sit down and put yours on? You put yours on first. Because if you don't put yours on first and you're busy helping others, you eventually will starve of oxygen and you will become a liability for that plane load. Are you a liability this morning? I know at times I am. I want to read a quote from Steps to Christ as we're closing. It is true that there may be an outward correctness of deportment without the renewing power of Christ. The love of influence and the desire for the esteem of others may produce a well-ordered life. Self-respect may lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. A selfish heart may perform generous actions. But by what means shall we determine whose side we are on? Who has the heart? With whom are our thoughts? Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are Christ's, our thoughts are with him. And our sweetest thoughts are of him. 
All we have and, and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. Whose disciple are you this morning? Just bow your heads. Start this prayer out of Romans 12. So here's what I want to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around. Place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings out the best of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Lord, we need you. As a church, Lord, and as individuals, I ask, Lord, that you will give us enthusiasm to spend time with you, Lord, getting to know you better. Refocus our lives, Lord, so that we will be enthusiastic to want to reach out to others, Lord, and follow the example you set for us, Lord. We need to become disciples after your kind, Lord, and to a stage where we want to serve and, and overflow, Lord, so that we will reproduce more disciples for you, Lord. You are coming soon, and we need to be ready. Be with us, Lord. I just want to thank you and praise you. Amen.